Welcome to First Baptist Church. Let's start our morning off with singing. Let's stand together if you're able and sing, Open My Eyes. What a good song to remind us why we're here, don't you think? You can go ahead and have a seat a second here, and I'll make you stand up in a minute. But um, I just want to uh, share a few announcements with you. 
Um, if you had brought an offering with you today, we don't take up a formal offering during the service, but there are buckets in the back. Uh, you can drop off an offering there. Make sure that you check out our website and our Facebook page or FBC app so that you know the various things that are going on. Uh, Rob, raise your hand. Uh, there will be a True Vine fundraiser trivia night on February 10th in Matawan. Yep. And if you would like to participate or sponsor a table for that, check Rob. Uh, you'll have a fun night. And I don't have pictures, but we give congratulations to the Tate family, uh, Zach and Laura, on the birth of twins, Natalie and Samuel. So they need your prayers, man, twins. <laughs> Two more uh, grandchildren for Bob and Camille and another couple great-grandchildren for Joyce. So that's great. Um, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we give you thanks uh, for this blessing that you have bestowed upon the Tate family. We pray, Father, you continue to give wisdom to Zach and Laura as they raise them, and to Bob and Camille as well as Joyce as they have significant impact in their children's lives. Father, we give you thanks for allowing us together today to lift up the name of Jesus. So open our eyes, Father that we may see him more clearly. Move in our hearts that we would draw closer to him. And may all that is done in this service be for your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together, Worthy, Worthy. No paddock will, no scribe in perfect skill. With flawless words could capture all you are. No lofty thought, no scholar of this world. Good grasp an inch of such infinity. Though we
All right, take a moment, turn to your neighbor this morning and greet them in the Lord. morning. We want to take a moment now for an opportunity for testimonies. Is there anything anyone wants to share from the message last week, what the Lord did in their life this week? Anything else happening you want to share today with the church family? He's going he's gonna to bring you a mic. We've got to make sure you have a mic so everybody can enjoy the testimony. Wait for that? No. My pastor took the thunder out of my praise today. So, <laughs> so we're blessed for Amen. all of them. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, so Joyce, Joyce, just so clear, this is not Zach's first children, right? David, is he already got children, right? The twins are not the first. No, they have a three-year-old brother. Okay. okay. Yeah. So they need even more prayer. <laughs> Yeah, and they, they were big twins. They were yeah. seven pounds and six and a half Holy cow. pounds. So. Yeah. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, Jason. I was just going to share, uh, just on a personal note, you know, for Lisa and I, we've been going through uh, our theology class, the DVDs, and uh, 
just been challenging ourselves again over the winter months here. And it's just been a blessing to go through that. And I would encourage anybody that's gone through that to maybe refresh it. Because it's amazing what you get out of it going through it over and over like that. You always get a new perspective and a new view. And uh, it's just been a blessing. So just sharing that. Um, so I don't know how many of you have seen some of my posts on Facebook. I know you've been praying for Nolan. Um, Nolan got a really good score on his assessment um, that brought down like his impairment level. Um, unfortunately, as good of progress as that is, that has made us now in danger of losing services for him um, because he improved too much. And then we've seen a lot of regression in the past couple weeks, even just since um, he had that assessment taken. And our social worker is doing everything that she can to try and submit another assessment um, to make sure that we can retain those services. But then she also informed me last Thursday that we're losing her um, because she's taking another position. And she's the only wraparound care coordinator in uh, Berrien County, and they don't know who they're gonna give our case to. Um, but even in spite of all of that, I don't know, I just feel really at peace with it. And I just know that, that God has been faithful in the past year and the past years that we've been going through all of this. And I've just seen him do some incredible things. And so I just, I don't know, I can't describe it other than God knows. And he's, he's already been where we're going and he has already been where we were and nothing surprises him. And so I just am trusting that he's gonna take care of it. Amen. Anyone else today? Yeah, I actually have something I've been thinking about, but it's not, it's not about last week's sermon. I'm still thinking about the message where you talked about the majesty of God. And I watch a lot of videos and training on outer space and that our Milky Way galaxy is so huge that it would take thousands and thousands of years to get even to the center of it. And we are in awe when SpaceX tries to, and fails to launch a rocket and everybody's just in, you know, weeping and the rocket goes up and blows up and doesn't even make it as far as the moon. And I think of how big our galaxy is, one of trillions of galaxies, and I was thinking the other day, God is even beyond that. He's bigger than all of that. But yet, he's so, his love is so great that he's right here with me or with Nolan or with each of us right where we are at all times. And that I just want to thank him and praise him for that. And then I, I, I hope I can spend the rest of my life trying to get that to work in my head because it's just beyond what I can even imagine or conceive. Great. Anyone else? Um, I just want to share how I've been blessed and... Um, it's been in seeing my kids growing in their faith and particularly Zoe, which I'm gonna embarrass her probably, but um, just several times now, she has been sharing what God is teaching her and it's through school and it's with horses and she's coming up with teachable moments that connect the two and I'm blown away. I'm just blown away sometimes by God, you know, working in her and I'm so grateful and thankful that, um, you know, he will use even them. And I just, it just blesses me. Amen. No. Anybody else? Great. Let's stand. We have to stand for this song. Holy, holy, holy.
you may have a seat this morning. Wow, thanks for sharing those uh, today. I don't, that, that such a blessing to hear how God's moving in your life and what he's showing you, you know? And, uh, you know, to, to hear the trust and reliance that you have on God, even during difficult times, is, is just truly amazing. Or, you know, f for you to recognize how God's moving in the life of your children, isn't that the desire of all, our, all parents? You know, God, move in our children. Move in them even more than you are in me. And, ah, all right. Blessing allows me to be ready. Are you ready? <laughs> Man, I, I want to continue this morning on our journey to discover the majesty of God as we look at understanding what God is like, who he is, looking at the attributes of God. And, you know, we have looked at a number of uh, different attributes up until this point, and I think it's kind of amazing. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but in the upcoming weeks, just pay attention to the songs that we sing. And how you can pick out and say, oh, we talked about that. Oh, we talked about that. Oh, we talked about that. Before I share the attributes of what we'll be looking at today, I want to give you a brief recap of where we have been on this journey so far. And let me begin by reminding you of A.W. Tozer's definition of an attribute. He said, an attribute of God is whatever God has in any way revealed as being true of himself. We sang holy, 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 perfect, power, love. These are all attributes of God. We noted that these are not characteristics of God. I had mentioned to you that characteristics are features or qualities of someone or something. They can and will change. Therefore, as we continue our journey, I'm only going to use attributes in relation to God and characteristics only in relation to man or anything else in creation. We also noted last week that God is not the sum total of his attributes. It's been said that man is the sum total of his parts, but such is not the case with the attributes of God. And we also noted last week that God is eternal, he is infinite, he is immaterial, and he is omnipresent. And while he is active within creation, he is not in any way, shape, or form bound by space, time, and matter. Not bound by anything in creation. Finally, and this is very, very, very important, God's attributes are always, always in perfect balance. One attribute is not elevated over another attribute. So you can see we have already covered a lot of ground, but our journey is far from over because that's not all that God has revealed about himself. Let me make a side note here. When I was putting together last week's message, uh, I only intended to address one attribute of God, the attribute of eternal. But as I was working toward a clearer understanding of this attribute, I realized how there are other attributes that were closely related to that. You know, he's infinite, he's immaterial, he's omnipresent. They're very closely related to one another, if not overlap one another. I have seen a number of different lists that individuals have compiled about the attributes of God, and they would have named all of those separately. Eternal, infinite, immaterial, omnipresent. And that's fine. That's fine. All four are listed separately, and that's not a big deal. It reminds me simply that God is not the sum total of his parts. It reminds me that his attributes are always in balance. It reminds me that no matter what list we might put together, it's never going to be able to fully describe everything there is to God. So, likewise, as I started putting together today's message, I intended to cover one specific attribute. 
Unfortunately, like last week, I came to see that there are other attributes that are very similar to the one that I wanted to address today. Attributes that are very closely related or if not overlapping of one another. So, with that understanding, it causes us to have to swim in deeper waters. But that's okay, because I like to swim. The attribute I'd like to begin with today is called self existence. God is self-existent. In the most basic of terms, self-existence means God has always existed. Novation was a scholar, a theologian, and a priest who lived between 200 and 258 AD. And his explanation of God's self-existence is very simple. Novation said, God has no origin. No origin. Now, if this sounds a lot like the attribute eternal, you'd be correct. Again, there are many similarities in God's attributes. Some scholars mention this attribute of self-existence is equivalent to God's aseity or God's independence, even though they might list these as three separate attributes, because you can. But I'm lumping them all together because the similarities are so close that if there is any distinction, actual distinction between the three, they are, they are the tiny, so subtle at best. Everything that we know of in creation has an origin. Apart from God, nothing is self-caused or self-existent. Whatever exists must have had a cause that preceded it. Now, this becomes a stumbling block for those who try to establish some kind of scientific proof that there is no God. You see, science can only deal with what is in creation. Those things that are governed by time or space or matter. So when science is given the task of trying to provide proof that there is or even is no God, they are set up for failure. Science continues to grapple with beginnings, how our universe came into existence. It has come to the conclusion that it is totally impossible for any kind of matter to just poof, pop into existence. Something cannot appear out of nothing. Therefore, it may come to the conclusion that something or someone had to start this whole process of creation, but they cannot prove its existence. And so as such, it becomes a topic for philosophers or for theologians. Now, I don't think that I'm the only person who has a hard time wrapping a, my mind around the concept of God's self-existence, that he always has been, that he, that he never had any beginning. The Bible doesn't use the term self-existent. It's a term that theologians put together to help us understand the fact that God has always existed. Now, there's nothing unusual about using words or terms that are not mentioned in the Bible. After all, we use the word Trinity, right, to, to refer to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but you're not going to find the word Trinity in the Bible. We use the word Godhead to refer to the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but you're not going to find the word Godhead in the Bible either. You won't find attributes such as omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence in the Scripture. But that doesn't mean that they're not good terms that have deep, deep meaning. We know what the word self means, right? We know what the word exist or existence means, right? So saying that God is self-existent is a way to help us understand that God has always, always existed. Think back in the Old Testament when God selected Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, 
And Moses was reluctant for a number of reasons. And at one point, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God's response to Moses, he reveals something of himself. He reveals that he is self-existent, that he is eternal, that he is infinite, that he is immaterial. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now, let's face it, right? Uh, I am who I am is not a name that you hear every day, is it? You know, in fact, apart from this interaction here with Moses, I have never heard this name before. I am who I am. I mean, can you imagine 6.30, 7 o'clock tonight, the announcer saying, the Lions are facing a third and goal. And I am who I am takes the snap, and he drops back, and he lets go of a bomb. <laughs> or stepping up to the plate for the Detroit Tigers is I am who I am. Or there's 30 seconds more left in the penalty, and I am who I am breaks free with the puck, and he's going towards the net, and he deeks it, and he shoots into the upper right corner. It's a goal! I am who I am has got a hat trick. As unusual a name as it may seem, it conveys something extremely, extremely important, something that's essential. And do you realize that after God said this to Moses, Moses didn't say, can you explain what in the world that means? I am who I am. But Moses must have understood. In fact, according to Psalm 90, verse 2, which was written by Moses, he declares, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth in the world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Pretty amazing. Let me share with you some implications of these attributes. First of all, God's existence does not depend on anyone. If God is self-existent, and he is, if he has no origins, and he doesn't, that means God's existence does not depend on anyone or anything. Do you know what that means? That means that God has always been and always will be exactly what he is. Therefore, God does not need any part of creation to enhance his existence. He's perfect. God cannot become more perfect. God cannot become less perfect. He cannot become more God than he is, nor can he ever become less God than he is. He has and always will be God. Here's another implication. God depends on no one. His existence does not depend on anything or anyone in creation. God doesn't exist just because you and I might believe he is, exists. And if all the atheists in the world gathered together and said God does not exist, they deny that, that does not mean that God does not exist. His existence is not dependent on whether one believes or does not believe. He is perfect and he is complete within the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, said this. He said, we're all human beings suddenly to become blind. Still the sun would shine by day and the stars by night. For these owe nothing to the millions who benefit from their light. So were every man on earth to become atheist, it could not affect God in any way. He is what he is in himself without regard to any other. To believe in him adds nothing 
to his perfections. To doubt him takes nothing away. God is God. God always will be God. He always has been God. That leads to another implication. God does not need you and I to worship him. If God has no needs, if he depends on no one, that means God does not need you and I to worship him. And I say that kind of with tongue in cheek because I know that the very reason we are gathered here together today as one body is to worship him. That's what we do. But he doesn't need us to worship him. This also means that God does not need us to help him. Not only does he need you and I to worship him because he's self-sufficient, God does not need you and I to help him in any way. Now just let that ferment in your minds. Because just, just because God gave us certain commands that we are to follow, certain responsibilities to carry out does not mean that God gave them to us because he needs help. Hey, you need help, Lord? Yes, God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Did God give this command to them? Because the one who created the heavens and the earth and everything in it, the one who created man and woman in the first place needs help? Of course not. Of course he didn't need any help. Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave this command to his disciples. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Did he give this command because he needs our help? Of course not. Of course not. God does not need you and I to manage the world. God does not need you and I to further his kingdom. These are responsibilities that are a privilege that God shares with us simply because he wants to, because they are a blessing to us. In addition, God does not need us to defend him. That doesn't mean we don't speak out on his behalf. That doesn't mean that we don't address those who speak against him or try to dishonor him. But there are some things that we Christians do in the name of Christ that is just absolutely absurd. Bombing buildings, <laughs> causing bodily harm, committing murder, using derogatory names against individuals are just totally unacceptable. It's been said that a God who needs to be defended is no God. God does not need us to defend him. You see, he is our defender. He's our defender. He is the self-existent one. Because God does not depend on anyone or anything in creation, because he is self existent God doesn't need our love now I know we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart soul mind and strength we are to love God in this fashion not because God is lacking in the love department here's another implication God is not answerable to us or anyone from a human perspective, we don't like this. Everybody's accountable to somebody, right? As Christians, we have this tendency to think that this aspect of God, considering 
the, the belief that God has to answer to someone is an aspect that pertains to those individuals that do not know him or to those who flat out reject God. But I, I have to tell you, the ones who have the greatest problem with this are not unbelievers. It's those who are already in Christ. You see, we have this tendency, especially when things are not going our way, to question God. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? I don't understand it. You better tell me what's going on. We seem to want to, God to have to give an account of himself to defend his actions. And sometimes God reveals his ways to us, why he's doing something. But you know, oftentimes... He doesn't. We just trust. We just hold on to him because he's the anchor of our soul. To a great degree, I don't think an unbelieving world expects God to give an account of himself because they don't believe in him in the first place. So basically, here we have it. God's existence does not depend on anyone. God depends on no one. He does not need us to help him. God does not need us to defend him. God does not need you and I to worship him. And God does not need you and I to love him. He is the self-existent one. The I am who I am. From a human perspective, these implications can be rather sober, right? I mean, you can sit and listen to that and think, wow. Wow. What a bummer, Jerry. (laughs) But that's because we're viewing these things from a human perspective. But you know, God's not human, right? God is God. As such, these implications of God's attributes reveal just how majestic God really is. So if you feel kind of bummed out, if you feel a bit insignificant, if you're feeling a little bit disappointed because of what we have covered, let me share some good news with you from these six implications. Let's look at the first one. God's existence does not depend on anyone. The blessing, the good thing I see in this is the truth that God has always been exactly what he is. He has no origin. He has no beginning. He is the beginning of all that is. Everything that is created finds its source in him, including you and including me. I find strength in this. Strength in this. I find security in this. It is encouraging for me to know that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God depends on no one. The good news I see in this Implication is even though God depends on no one to supply anything he needs, he chooses in accordance with his good pleasure and his will to the praise of his glorious grace as Ephesians 1, 5 through 6 states, to bless you and I with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God does not depend on you and I to supply him something that he lacks because he lacks nothing. On the other hand, it is you and I who are dependent on him, the self-existent one, for all that we are, all that we have, all that we are to become would be pointless without him. Without him, we would cease to exist. What about the third one? God does not need you and I to worship him. If God does not need you and I to worship him, why bother gathering together for worship? Isn't it just a waste of time? The answer to these questions is absolutely not. Worship is never, never a waste of time. In fact, it is the most noble activity that those who are in Christ Jesus can engage in. Worship is an active response to God whereby we declare his worth. That's why we sing holy, holy, holy. That's why we sing worthy, worthy, worthy. Declaring God's worth is never a waste of time. 
in an answer to the question, why then should we gather together to worship God? We gather for this purpose because it's the most important thing that we can do together. Even though God doesn't need you and I to worship him, because he lacks anything, because he lacks only the glory that you and I might be able to supply, he allows us through worship to share in his glory. And not only do we share in his glory, we have the opportunity to declare his glory to others. The psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the works of his hands. And not only do the heavens and the skies declare the glory of God, you and I have that opportunity and privilege again of sharing his glory with other individuals. God does not need you and I to worship him. But someday, someday, we will join a heavenly host and say, you are worthy our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they were created and have their being. Someday we're going to join with an angelic host with a loud voice declaring, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Someday... We will, with every creature in heaven on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea, and all that is in them, singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever, someday. I'm looking forward to that day. God does not need our worship because he's lacking anything, but he provides a way for you and I to direct our praise and worship to him, thereby sharing in his glory. How about this one? God does not need us to help him. The good news in that is he doesn't need us to help him, but he chooses to use you and I to carry out his purpose for mankind. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What a privilege. Jesus himself declared that he came to do the will of him who sent him. Likewise, you and I have the opportunity to do the will of the one who called us, the one who saved us and equipped us. God doesn't need our help, but he allows us to join his plan to redeem a people for himself. What a privilege. God doesn't need us to defend him. Doesn't need us to defend him. He's perfectly capable of defending himself. But he does allow us to take the good news and to share it with all nations. He allows us to preach the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. No, it's not us who defends God. Rather, it's God the Son who defends us from the accuser of the brethren. And finally, God does not need our love. He doesn't need our love because he's lacking. The good news is he allows us to share in his perfect love. Not only do we share in his perfect love, Scripture tells us that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Again, it's not God who lacks, it's us. And God gives us exactly what we need. And for those of us who are in Christ, do you realize that nothing at all, nothing at all can separate us from his love? Scripture says, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, separate me, separate you 
from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a majestic God. What a majestic God. I pray that these attributes we looked at today will increase your reverence and awe for God. That it will increase your sense of how majestic He really is. May your understanding and appreciation draw you closer to Him. Let's spend some time in prayer, shall we? Contemplating these things, giving thanks for these things. Also, during this time, I encourage you to continue to pray for Nolan and his, uh, his health issues. And while we're rejoicing with Caroline and what God's doing in her life, let's shift that prayer now to Anna, who is dealing with some uh, health issues as well, and I'm sure she would covet our prayers. Let's pray as the Lord leads.
just before we conclude our time with the self-existent one. Let's join our voices together declaring his praise again by standing and singing together, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. As we depart from here, let's make sure that this week until we gather together again, may everything that we do be for his honor and glory. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith.